The ancient Greek or Roman pantheon, with its multitude of gods and goddesses, minor and major deities, is as diverse and complex as the myriad of human experiences they represent. On our last installment showing gods on ancient coins, I felt like there was a need to explore the topic a little bit further. Today, let's explore some of the goddesses and muses, how living women actually became goddesses portrayed on coins, and how even entire cities were deified. Let's go! The male-female dichotomy as opposites, but also as complementary to one another, is very beautifully explored in the Greek or Roman mythology. Gods are very commonly associated with another, female entity that opposes and complements him. And when you look at both gods and what they represent together, the end result becomes a beautiful metaphor of an important aspect of our lives. It's better that I, that I illustrate. Hades, the god of the underworld, may be seen as a very grim reminder that everything withers away and dies, but once you look at him in contact with his wife, the goddess Persephone, goddess of rebirth and sprouting veg vegetation, you realize they don't just represent death, but the normal cycle of life and seasons, the withering of an old generation of people, the end of the year, are nothing more than the end of a cycle, making way for a rebirth and new beginnings for all. Another really interesting male-female relationship can be seen between Zeus and his daughter, Athena. The relationship between these two gods illustrates the idea of power, leadership, and the responsible use of such big powers. It was undeniable that Zeus was by far the most powerful of the gods, reigning supreme over the pantheon and bending mortal men to his will. But Zeus would also quickly devolve into brutish, abusive, and tyrannical behavior. Fortunately, he would be constantly advised by his daughter, Athena, keeper of knowledge, wisdom, prudence, and good rulership. The harmonious relationship between the two allowed for the adequate use of Zeus's overwhelming power in a well-directed, responsible ruler, a reference to what a good emperor or king of the ancient world should be. Powerful, unstoppable, but wise, intelligent, and well-mean to those under his power. And since we're talking about Athena, it's probably a great idea to get started by looking at a coin that features the goddess. The city of Sigeon in northwest Anatolia was for a long time an ally and tributary of Athens, making part of the Delian League. A good way of showing the support of the city to its suzerain Athens was by adopting iconography on their coins that claimed such a thing, like this one, struck between 355 in 335 BC. On the obverse, we see Athena, a clear nudge to their Athenian friends, but instead of the classical Athenian coin with a side-facing portrait, we're greeting with this lovely three-quarters facing bust of Athena. What is remarkable about this obverse is that this is a bronze coin. This is not supposed to circulate very widely, yet a lot of effort was made into putting a facing portrait on it which was much harder to achieve than a normal side-facing portrait. Well, the reverse is directly inspired on the classical Athenian owl, up to the little moon to the left of the bird. On this interpretation of the coin, we can see the owl facing us, the observer, but instead of the letters Alpha, Theta and Epsilon of Athenaion of the Athenians, we have the abbre abbreviation Sige, probably Sigeionion or coin from Sigeion. And going forward, we're back to the amazing die engravers of Syracuse. The bronze coins from Syracuse feature a vast variety of deities on them. And in this example, struck under the reign of Hieron II between 275 and 215 BC, we have Persephone. Coins like this, which considering its size indicate this must have been a smaller denomination, must have been used for smaller transactions like buying grain, so I feel like it's a perfect use for a goddess that represents the flow of seasons and the coming of a new harvest. On the obverse, 
you see the image of the queen of the underworld looking left, with her hair decorated with grain ears, since Persephone symbolized the sprouting of the new harvest. Whenever you see a deity wearing something in his or her head, pay close attention to it and try to extract meaning from that, because it is certainly a message that is trying to be associated with the deity. So we, we can also see the legends from Syracuse in Greek around the borders. Now on the reverse, we see a bow with the club of Hercules above him. Very typical for the coin of Hieron, since he was a tyrant, the entire region knew it, and a lot of his public image relied on him passing the idea of being, a, being capable, being strong and defending himself. Particularly so considering Syracuse was right between Carthage and Rome, the two major Mediterranean powers. So we move on to an unusual denomination. We know the base silver unit was the drachma, and it had a fraction, the oboe. But how about a multiple of an oboe that doesn't really get to being fully a drachma? Here we have a tetrabol, a four oboe coin, minted at Histiaia, a city located at Eoboia, Greece's second largest island, around 195 BC. So being located at an island and having a strong relationship with the local rivers and the sea, as normal, the engravers of Histiaia chose to depict one of on the obverse, this lovely bust of a nymph, a female spirit that represented nature. She's seen with a beautiful hairdo, with palettes as decoration. And on the reverse, we see the same nymph on board of a small ship. We can see her wearing a dress, grabbing the ship's mast, the curved prow, and the legends, Histiaion, translated to from Histiaia. This is a reasonably common kind of coin, but a lovely one. A very simple but elegant design that pretty much calls your attention, even though this is a relatively tiny coin. While we then move to the Roman Empire, the official religion of the empire was this very interesting mix between the original Greek or Roman religion with a cult of personality that connected people, particularly aristocracy, to the divine. It allowed emperors, empresses, and those people of particularly great feats to officially achieve godhood in case of a virtuous reign or a great life. The second century was a golden age for Rome, and as a result, a big number of emperors and empresses have made it to this select group of deified people. One of them was Faustina, the wife of Antoninus Pius, very well liked for her treatment of the poor and disenfranchised of Rome, in particular by taking care of orphan girls. Faustina died of a sudden illness in 140 AD and was promptly deified. So here we have a denarius of a brand new goddess. On the obverse, we can see the bust of Faustina with her very distinctive hairstyle that apparently was emulated by Ro Roman women for an entire three generations after her passing. The legends make reference to her divine status. Diva, goddess, Faustina. And on the reverse, we see the queen of the gods, Juno, holding her scepter and raising her hand, almost like saluting Faustina among the gods. A very touching scene from the Romans to their beloved empress. The legends, Eternitas, Eternity, definitely marking she has been deified. So as I said, the Romans really liked to diversify their pantheon. The Greek goddess Tyche was the main protective goddess of cities and fortifications, being very commonly depicted on coins as a goddess wearing a crown made out of the walls and towers of that city. So the concept of Tyche was absorbed by the Romans and evolved into personifications of each city, with its certain attributes that set each city apart. Different types of clothing or headgear were used to differentiate one city from another and to sort of like incarnate the entire spirit of a region into one easily recognizable and venerable entity. So for this next coin, let's head to the reign of Nero, where the second largest city of the empire, Alexandria, still minted coins in the denominations reminiscent from the Greeks and with Greek letters, 
by using Roman imagery. This is a tetadrachma, a four drachma piece, struck at the 12th year of the reign of Nero, between 65 and 66 AD. So if you are wondering why this coin has this unusual color, it is because Egyptian coins were heavily debased, as in a lower silver content. A tetadrachma worth four drachma, or in principle four denarii for equivalence, only had the silver content of a single denarius. Egypt was very important to the Romans for their vast grain supplies that directly fed Rome and the major trade routes with the Far East. Therefore, it operated on a closed monetary standard. No coins from the outside could circulate inside Egypt, nor any Egyptian coins could get out. They all had to be exchanged when crossing the border. So, in a sense, this must have been one of the first cases of a command economy. The emperor could not afford major disruptions on the price of important commodities, such as the grain, that went to Rome. So the entire monetary supply of Egypt was tightly controlled and debased to force a stability of prices. So back to our coin here. On the obverse, we see a stylized bust of Nero, very different from the very realistic depictions from imperial coins, wearing a radiate crown. In legends in Greek, which read, Neuro Claudio Caesaro Sebasto Germanico, or Nero Claudius Caesar Emperor Germanicus. But for me, the reverse is the real highlight of this coin. You see the incarnation of the city of Alexandria. Maybe she's not depicted on the most attractive of modern beauty standards, but she can be seen wearing this lovely elephant he head as a headgear. On some of the very first coins minted in Egypt, the Tetadrachma of Ptolemy I, he would be depicted using that same elephant headdress. These are among some of the most desired Hellenistic pieces, so it's very interesting to see another coin, minted some 400 years after Ptolemy, taking the same base ideas and inspiration. And next, we go to probably one of the most common and easily collectible city goddesses out there, which are the duo Constantinopolis, Rome, minted by Constantine the Great to celebrate the foundation of Constantinople and establishment of the new imperial capital there. Let's take a look at this lovely duo. So first, for the new imperial capital. These coins were minted all throughout the empire to spread the word of the new city being raised by Constantine over the older, smaller city of Byzantium. This piece, in particular, was struck in Antioch, between the years 330 and 331 AD. So in the obverse, we see Constantinople as a militaristic goddess. I would say with clear traces that could connect her to Athena or Minerva. We see she's wearing a plumed helmet, holding a scepter, symbol of the power of the new capital. And we can appreciate she has all sorts of jewels and decorations on her robes. Which makes perfect sense, as the emperor wanted this new city to be by far the most grandiose city on the planet. The legends are very simple, the name of the new city in Latin, Constantinopolis. The reverse features another goddess, Victory. She was the messenger of Jupiter, and very commonly they're seen together on coins, although this time we see her by herself. We see she's standing on top of a ship, carrying a scepter and a shield. The meaning is very simple on this reverse. It's a reinforcement of the idea that this new city would be the new place where the emperor would project his authority and his military might. And on the lower part, we see the letters S, M, A and T, Sacra Moneta, the holy city of Antioch. But Constantine knew very well he was the ruler of the Roman Empire not the Constantinople Empire. A numismatic move that could be seen as a political fiasco by forgetting about the old capital was gracefully avoided by issuing, in equal numbers, coins celebrating Dea Roma, the goddess of the city of Rome itself. Roma is very commonly depicted on coins from the Republican times all the way to the very late empire. And this coin, also struck between 330 and 331 AD in Siscia, honors the, new, the old capital. On the obverse, we see Dea Roma with her helmet 
and a decorated cuirass, and the legends Urbs Roma, the city of Rome. The reverse features the old motif of the twin founders of Rome, Romulus and Remus, suckling on the mythical she-wolf. On the lower part, the letters Gamma, the third letter of the Greek alphabet, and Cis, meaning it was minted on the third mint of Siskia, on modern-day Croatia. Assembling a typeset of deities on coins is one of these fantastic goals that almost seem to be unreachable. You can amass hundreds of coins with different entities, and there's a very good probability there will be some other obscure god or goddess lurking around that's still not in your collection. So if you particularly enjoyed any of the coins featured in this video and would like to assemble your own goddesses and muses typeset, I have some good news for you. Our sponsors at Savoca Coins will be having these coins up for auction on their 103rd Blue Auction, being held on the 22nd and 23rd of May 2021. Their blue auctions feature all kinds of coins, from Greek to Roman, medieval and even modern, and are a great opportunity to expand your collection into a more affordable way. So if you are interested, definitely check them out. And if you are watching this video after the auction day, don't worry, just head over to savoca-coins.com and take a look as another auction should definitely be happening soon. So have you got any goddesses on your collection that you particularly like? Do you prefer the Greek versions of the original Pantheon or their Roman adaptations? Any particular city goddess that you like? Let us know in the comments below. And if you like this video, please leave a like and consider subscribing so we can keep bringing ancient coins to YouTube. I hope you all stay safe and see you soon.